So uh, for this year's presentation, I wanted to work on something that was a little bit hands-on. We've been doing a lot more large-scale projects in late as of late with Mojolingo, and there's a, a lot of things that uh, we'll learn. Uh, when having to deal with large numbers of calls and large numbers of uh, setups and many different uh, challenges that usually were relegated to the domain of telecom providers. Um, so, um, uh, thank, uh, thank you, Matt, for introducing myself. I am the principal at Mojolingo. We build uh, application, real-time applications in the SIP and WebRTC domain and similar stuff. Um, we are the maintainers of the Adhesion Ruby framework, which I'll give you a little bit more information about later. And uh, we build IVRs, dialer apps, WebRTC apps, Recently, mobile apps. I got a new outstanding developer on board, and we've been we are on our second mobile app project, and it's turning out really well. Um, so, some nomenclature. Everybody knows what the dialer is, but there might be somebody who are not familiar with the alphabet soup that comes with uh, high volume dialing. So, uh, a dialer is something that makes outbound calls to be eventually connected to an agent, ideally. Sometimes they don't, but I'll get into that later. Um, there's two types of dialers, progressive and predictive. A progressive dialer will wait for an agent, so someone that can uh, pick up the call to the customer uh, before dialing a call. So that those are usually relegated to high value calls for which you absolutely need to be sure that if someone answers, there's someone or, or in your company and that's available to answer. Uh, while uh, predictive dialers will place more calls than the number of agents you have, so your agents are always at maximum utilization capacity, at the cost of sometimes having calls hit what's called the gray zone. So what you get is someone, I call you, you answer, but I don't have any agent that's available to talk with you. So depending on specific application, you will end up either having to play a message or putting them in a queue or whatever, dead air. We do dead air here uh, for reasons I'll teach you about. So. You can, another difference is parked agents versus dialed agents. So, uh, parked agents means your agents are already in asterisk. You have them dialing asterisk and just wait and music on hold, and when a call comes in, you bridge them immediately. That's faster, but as more resource utilization is not always doable because you can not always have agents that are already dialed into your Astra server before they can answer calls. Or you just dial them. So when I call someone, they answer, then Astra dials my agent, and when they get connected, there's a communication of some sorts. Two important metrics we'll be going over all over the presentation are CPS, calls per second, and CC, which is concurrent calls. Calls per second is how many new calls are made every second. And concurrent calls are how many active calls you have on the system, whether or not they're already answered, the ringing, calls that are existing at any given time. Dollars are evil, right? Eh. Everybody's got to pay rent, right? Okay, so it, dollars sometimes can be evil, sometimes can be more evil than others. This is pretty evil. Um, project requirements. We've been uh, dealing with very aggressive predictive dialing. These guys run a, up to a 10 per multiplier. So for every agent, I have them running 10 calls. Because the most important thing in this particular domain is dialing out as much as possible and reaching out to as many people as possible. We don't care if you lose calls. We don't record calls un unless it's in the uh, um, uh, quality assurance phase. And um, there's a few requirements the product adds. So essentially, there was the, uh, the, need, the ability to define a specific prompt for each uh, campaign was uh, required, and other sound files. Why am I telling you specifically about sound files? Because that turned out to be one of the biggest challenges in the project, getting the sound files distributed to the asterisk nodes that are dialing. So if company A has a campaign that says, we are company A, you, would you like to buy our product? And the other says, we are company B, would you like to sell us your used car? Uh, those would need to upload it and be distributed somehow. Uh, the system is entirely multi-tenancy and cloud-based, so you can just log in and register and buy credit and you can start dialing. Uh, prompts can be uploaded via uh, file upload. You can use Watson TTS to generate a phrase from text. You can use TTS from generate text in call. So if your name is uh, Jack, you can have, hello, Jack, this is company A calling you and that's picked from the CSV you upload with the data, can be recorded through WebRTC in the browser, or there can be a recording via a phone call. 
Uh, each campaign is a set of prompts, and a destination means that a user is connected to an agent when they press a number. What happens is that we call you, you hear a message that says, we are company B, we would like to buy your used car, please press one if you're interested into this. And when you press one, the agent is actually dialed. We also do answering machine detection, which turned out to be another of the pain points. Uh, so you have to uh, make sure that you're speaking to a machine or a human. Uh, in our opinion, tuning AMD has, is better if it's done with a slant. So you'd, you'd better decide if you'd prefer that some machine are detected as humans or vice versa, because getting perfect AMD is impossible. And in this particular case, uh, we didn't really care about the answer machines themselves. It was okay if the message, same message was played to an answer machine or a human just because of how it's built, it can be different in other domains. Numbers, this is interesting. So these guys upload lists that are 10,000 to 100,000 numbers at a time. Uh, they dial the very aggressive multipliers. Uh, our calculation that they will be roughly needing 1,000 CPS, which while not being huge, it's a big number in the context of uh, an application built by a single, com single company that's running dollars. With about 10,000 DAFI calls, why are there uh, so little active calls, you'd expect more. So we're doing uh, massive overdialing, which means that most of the calls are really short and end up just falling off. And um, just the people, and between the overdialing and the fact that people have to actually interact, so press one because that's required uh, to be put in contact with an agent, it means that we don't have many active calls actually going through the system that are actually connected to agents and thus become longer. Because if you're speaking to an agent, it will take maybe five. It's the average is seven point something minutes. And we need the resource fairness. So everybody, this is multi-tenancy. So I have an account, you have an account, he has an account. Our campaigns have to run at the same time and they have to be distributed correctly. So my calls don't all run and yours don't. And you have to wait an hour. So how do we get there? What did we do to build this application? Pain points. Uh, everybody that's uh, dealt with asterisk dialing out knows there's a few ways to have asterisk actually play call place calls to destinations. Uh, we had to decide if you wanted to go the old style route of having a huge server or three or four huge servers running calls instead of going with a more modern VM based approach. Asterisk configuration. How to distribute media files. That was actually interesting because uh, asterisk HTTP playback is sort of slow. So we have to actually preload the file somehow. Otherwise, the, it's very anticipable. And call progress management, which means that monitoring what each call is doing proves to be a uh, resource intensive task if you run dealing with that many calls. So yeah, we had to figure out a way to do it with very low resource consumption, also because it's very low priority. I don't care if I know what each of my calls is doing down to the millisecond. I just need that eventually the reporting gets reconciled to a consistent state. Uh, so um, we have so files are uploaded to a web server, and uh, then the asterisk servers have to somehow play those files into the calls. There's a few ways to go about it, and we settle to and, and a solution I'll show you uh, instead of using HTTP play, playback because HTTP playback on well not only asterisk really any mm, platform uh, is slow because it will download the file and then play it. Some of these prompts are maybe 50K, which is not big, but it's big enough that you can notice. Like, you, you pick up the phone and nothing is playing for a second. Feels like something's wrong. So that's why you have to work around that. So dial out method. Main ways to dial out calls from outside asterisk and not counting ARI because we're not using that yet. Uh, we're using, you can place call files. You probably, it's more of an older school style of, uh, style of dial, uh, dial calling, but you, you've seen that happen. So you can just place formatted text files in a directory and asterisk will pick them up and dial those calls out. Or you can do CLI originate, which means essentially just running asterisk dash rx originate blah blah to from a script or something, which sort of works. Or since we use addition, we maintain addition, and when you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail, we tested the three methods against using AMI through addition and found out that in this particular case, there was uh, no noticeable performance difference between the three methods. So we went with the one that gives us the biggest flexibility. 
Addition is a Ruby framework to build telephone applications, and it allows you to do extremely complicated things easily because it's Ruby. So your dial plan is now running in Ruby, and you can do everything that a Ruby application can. Uh, large versus small. This is important. So do I get the usual 64, 128 gigabyte memory server and buy three of those on Iron, deploy them, and have calls running on those? Or do I go the more modern route of servers managed as cattle, not pets? So I just spin up more boxes as I need them. Turns out that nowadays with how hypervisors work, network, um, virtual networking works, et cetera, uh, we ended up with the, going with the smaller route. We just spin up a lot of nodes. The eight core 16 gigabytes of RAM example I'm giving is just an example. I mean, if you buy four machines that are two cores and four gigabytes, or one which is eight and 16, it would cost you the same amount of money. And Doing it with VMs allows us to auto scale in real time, which is important here because this the kind of dialing is done in waves. So in the weekends, they're doing roughly double the time the calls that we're used to seeing during the week. So I will advise during small servers. Asterisk configuration. In their particular case, we disabled everything. Like this literally only has Chen SIP and AMI and things that cannot be disabled. Because you don't need anything when you do this kind of dialing, really. Uh, it's important, and I can never stress enough, uh, that mm, this kind of platform, whether it's Astros, FreeSwitch, or others, look at your modules, look at what you're loading, and see if there's anything you can remove. Because small things can make a big difference. We're using IP authentication for the outgoing trunk. This is another little interesting trick. So instead of uh, registering as a peer to your SIP provider, just use IP authentication so that you, uh, you skip the registration, uh, unauthorized, and re-registration with digest step, and it's much faster. This was actually one of the biggest uh, improvements we got when we started looking at really how to get performance better. It's also quite easy to do, just get a provider who will allow you to do IP authentication. Of course, your limits. Everything has to be unlimited. Just set your asterisk to be the master of its own domain. Yes? We set up it as a large uh, private network on DigitalOcean who has an internal router that we just set the calls going on from there. You. Or you can whitelist IPs, depends on really what, your, what your current infrastructure is. Uh, we're not using Docker. So Evan, my colleague and coworker, which is a great fan of Docker, told me we should be using Docker. But we did test Docker for a while. And it might be doing to me not knowing the Mm, domain very well, but performance was very low compared to just running on VMs. It's probably something I need to investigate more. So that's uh, that, that should be an asterisk next to it. Not asterisk as in the web server, but at the telephone server, but asterisk as in, I'm not sure. Right now we're not using Docker, just Ansible. Media file distribution. HTTP playback is pretty slow, I'm looking at you. <laughs> it is incredible. <laughs> uh, preloading files is much better. Uh, we need, of course, at, at the point when you decide you want to preload files, we just went with addition. Addition is managing the entire call. So what we do is, before I'm calling someone, I just go through the script, and there's five files I have to download, and getting them through the network just takes a split second, and the call is not running yet. So the user does not know we're actually downloading files because there's no waiting time. When the call gets started, the audio files are already there. There is some kind of a ca cache control mechanism that we remove stale files, et cetera, et cetera, so we don't fill up the disk. But uh, that's, that makes it easier. Uh, other uh, things could have been an FSS mount or really any kind of shared disk. Uh, but mm, this allows us to work better with the uh, dump telephony server paradigm that we choose, and I'll, I'll show you why. Code progress. So as I said, we need to um, make sure that th I know that this particular call is dialing, then it's ringing, then it's uh, being answered, then the user has pressed one, then they're ringing the agent, then they're with the agent, then it's done, right? All the state changes and various permutation of it. What we uh, tried first is simply doing HTTP posts. So every time something happened with a call, we'd post at the uh, web app and tell it the call is now being answered. Turns out that was a huge resource drain. Might be in Ruby, might be on, I don't know. What we ended up doing is uh, simple state is pushed to a ready a slow priority queue. So 
the call states are just pushed in there with a timestamp so we can reconstruct them eventually. Keep in mind that in many of these cases, we focus too much on the technical problem at hand. So a developer will say, no, I want state in real time. You have to take a step back and figure that for the most part, you don't care if you know that a call is being answered right this split second, even if you get that half a second later, it doesn't matter, even if the context of a UI. People are watching a screen where there's numbers going with calls, nothing else. They don't know, they don't even know. So I'll say this, uh, the cost of sounding bad, they don't even know if the number is showing a real, in a sense. So you can, you know, play with them a little and get better throughput, which is what your customer cares about. Better throughput, nothing else. So what is addition? It's a Ruby voice application framework. Uh, Third-party call control. It's essentially a dial plan on steroids. Allows you to do uh, anything the dial plan does and much more, plus uh, event rea reacting to events, originating calls. It's backed by a foundation. We have been at RC1 for a while now, <laughs> I know. And eventually it will become addition 3.0. I, I just probably just going to release it. I don't care if there's still something left to do on it. It's uh, oh, Everything is on it is marginal. Use RC1 is perfect, it's great, works great, it's in production in this system and other hundreds. And it's backed by a foundation, so it's, uh, it's interesting that you have an open source project you can rely on. I prefer open source projects that are backed by either large companies or consulting companies of some sorts or foundations. So it's, it's never going away, so keep try using it and ask me about it after the talk, which is not about addition. So what do we end up with? Each asterisk runs one on one with an addition process, which manages, as we remember, picking up calls from a radius queue, getting the audio files for that call, dialing the call to the user, and reporting what's going on in terms of its ringing, uh, etc. We're doing small VM instances. These are the uh, DigitalOcean $20, for, for possibly $40 instances of four cores and four gigabytes each. And uh, we keep calls. Uh, so we're doing it a little bit more aggressively. The ideal numbers for CPS and uh, concurrent calls will be a little bit lower, but we're trying to contain costs. So we're trying to uh, avoid auto-scaling spinning up boxes every 10 seconds when there's a spike in traffic. So we allow the boxes to be a little bit more overloaded than they should be. That's something I will not advise you to do unless you're doing what we're doing, which is low value, high volume dialing. We literally don't care if a call gets lost because we're going to call the guy again in 10 minutes and then again and then again until he submits to the mercy of the dollar. <laughs> Capitally. Everything is managed by web application. It's just the usual thing. You register, you buy credit, and then you upload lists and you start harassing people. Um, yes? The AMI, okay. it's everything. Everything goes through it. Yeah, call files are uh, comparable in performance, which is something I did not expect. I would expect them to be slower, but since there was uh, they're not even not faster either, we just went with the easiest route. Uh, Redis is the core of this thing. Everything goes through Redis. Calls are distributed through Redis, and this gives us implicit auto discovery, which is a fancy way to say that we can add a telephony node to the network and not having to worry about anything. Because what they do is each new telephony node knows where Redis is and will start picking up calls from Redis immediately. Each call is serialized as it, with all the information it needs. So it will have the list of the sound files we need to play, of course, the number to dial, all other information that we need. And uh, a, new, a new server can just go up and start taking calls without any intervention. We have minimal monitoring and the fact that we actually know how many nodes we have through a simple ping. Uh, pull up uh, script. So when, when a new server goes online, it will tell us that it's live. But other than that, uh, there's no configuration involved, no discovery, nothing of the sort. Everything is pulled based on the queue. Uh, you had mentioned earlier that um, when doing your predictive dialer or for that matter, any predictive dialer, that should be the only processes running on the box, they not combined with the company's main post. Oh yeah, of course. That's uh, these are completely different. These servers will be barely usable as a PBX. Like they're missing three quarters of the uh, three quarters of the features. 
exactly. Those are, uh, you will barely be able to use this to run actual calls for a company. So in, in a pinch, that's how it's built. You'll notice Homer down there, which was mentioned later. But generally speaking, all we do is Rails will take a list of calls, push them to read this, and then the N asterisk nodes will just pick one of those calls, dial it, do whatever you need to do with it, and report, done. And then this goes back to Rails, will then reprocess the list, see that you avoided getting hit by the dollar the first time, and call you again, and then again. Uh, well, no, uh, Postgres is actually, uh, it's, uh, I think it's multi-master replication, which is, uh, it's, a no, it's uh, three nodes, I think. I would like to check with the guy in charge of the infra. It started out with one box just because we we're developing. Now, I think it's now it's a three, uh, should be a three shard uh, database. Same thing for Redis. I know Redis is a three node uh, system currently, which makes it pretty Brazilian. And uh, I think everything comes in trees here. So we have three uh, Postgres nodes, three web nodes, and three Redis shards clustered together. And then there's about 50 uh, asterisk boxes. Yeah, there's 50 asterisk boxes. Just right, nice as a number. So how do we test something like that, which is really what we would like to look at? So how many calls can we run? How do we further improve performance? And are we reaching our targets? These people asked us to get a very specific amount of throughput that came from their calculations of how to keep their customers happy. So you need to make sure uh, to know what you're doing. So first thing you need to do is, you're, if you're testing a telephony application, and especially if you're doing sizing, so you need to know how many calls you can run, you need to drive traffic somehow. If you're in case, in case you're, it's an inbound application, you can make calls using a variety of tools. But in this case, we were dialing out, so we're calling people. So Asterisk itself is driving the load. We need something to sync the load and tell us what's going on. End-to-end uh, -end testing can be difficult to automate uh, because you need to have some agents that will answer, play some audio, then press one, then wait for a little, then play some more audio, etc. After a long, you know, I played around the usual suspect, PJ, SUA, CP, uh, CP Cup, which is a nice Ruby library to build CP scenarios. I ended up using Asterisk as the dial target which is amazing how good Asterisk can be in that regards. Just build a simple dial plan that you call number 111 and it will do something. The 222 will do something else. Allows you to make deterministic tests and is uh, extremely effective. So I will advise if you're testing an outbound dollar, just dial another other Asterisk servers. Um, it's easy to set up the dial plan. Ansible nodes make it a snap. Uh, nodes is mm, entered twice, whatever. Okay. Um, Ansible makes it easier to pull up more nodes on your receiving side of things. It can answer, right? press it me off, press audio, and do a lot of complicated stuff. And you can host a capture agent there. So your Astri server as a testing target can provide you with another point of view on what is really going on regarding quality of your service. Uh, just make sure you're not actually overloading your target service. We did that at the beginning, of course. Like we had 50 Astri dollars dialing into two Astri boxes. And they were melting on the wrong side. So it would just, it would, we'd get horrible results, then we notice, look, I think we're just melting the targets. So we, uh, we just added more, it's, uh, it's easy to do. So what are you looking for when you're testing not only a dollar, but in general, a uh, telephone application? Call set up times and quality of service. So perceived quality, what your users think your system is doing, if the users think it's going good. Latency, packet loss, jitter, and in general, access call quality and uh, mean objective score. As call setup times, defined as how long between pickup and playback. So I get a call, I pick up the phone, and Asus is supposed to play me an audio file. How long does uh, dead air last before I hear something? It's usually very short, but when you start overloading an Asus server, you will notice that those times increase, and that's incredibly annoying. It's subjective, but to me, two f 250 milliseconds is already too much. Like, I pick up, hello, hello, we're calling you for, that's, that's the gap we're looking for. That's uh, easy to measure, and also it's very important from a um, quality standpoint, perceived quality standpoint. Some of these measurements are objective, some of them are subjective, some of them are numbers, some others are just how do I feel about the quality of your system, and they're both important. So 
Everybody knows what latency is, probably, but uh, it's the amount of uh, time a packet takes to traverse a connection. You generally measure latency to, the, to your endpoint, to the PSDN. Past that is not your problem, and you cannot do that to anything to solve it. Um, you want to stay below 150 uh, milliseconds. It's generally, it's a recommended number for really any real-time application. 150 to me is a little high, but when you're doing things that are low, low value, like this kind of calls, it's fine. Packet loss is actual packets that don't reach the target. RTP is UDP, so you can lose packets. They're just not there. Uh, they cannot be recovered. And I will advise measuring two things. 1% in an overall case, so packets to destination, but stay below 0.5% in your network. You say, well, my network is perfect. It doesn't lose packets. That's not true. Any single network instance where you're not just having two processes talk to each other will have some degree of packet loss. So keep that measured. And that's pretty important because it affects a lot of things like quality and uh, stability. You can lose calls uh, due to packet loss. Jitter is different than packet loss, but it's similar. Jitter is defined as the time drift between when I should have received a packet and when I actually get it. So uh, packets should be sent every X milliseconds, like a, a metronome, but some of them may be coming later, and your system has to reconstruct the, uh, the, uh, the interaction so it can keep playing media. Of course, if too much time passes, then it's packet loss, and I've, I've lost media because I've, I, I've lost the ability to keep the flow in place. Uh, recommended value is below 30 milliseconds. This is really a problem. This is something that we hit pretty early and led us to just scaling out to more servers because I don't know why CPU-wise it gets immediately problematic. It's probably networking, actually, not CPU, but that's what we saw. So MOS, this is a metric that not, not many people know about, or rather many people know about, but not enough. It's a call quality measurement that is defined as a formula that takes a few things into action account. It's actually supposed to be subjective because it's an opinion score, but turns out that uh, there's a couple formulas, one of which Homer and SIP Capture uses, uh, that will give you a pretty solid understanding of what you're doing. They go from one to five, but they're limited by the codec. So as you know, as a codec is by definition lossy, so it will lose, well, some of them are, most of what we use are. So the um, telephony, the voice that you're hearing, will lose some quality just because it's been compressed, right? So effectively, each of these uh, codex by virtue of calculations has a maximum score that is not 5. So G711 is supposed to never be able to go above 4.11 just because you're losing some information to compression. Always listening to your recordings. It's important because uh, it's small but it helps and it gives you a very solid understanding of you need to be sure what you're doing essentially. Just do recordings and listen to them. So what's giving us problems. Bandwidth. And this is one reason why spreading out to more servers is better. More servers means more network interfaces. More network interfaces means more, uh, more available bandwidth. Uh, there's a couple numbers in literature, like 87.2 uh, kilobytes per, uh, per second per call on, a, on G711, which is what we're using. It's a usual number to look at to see if you're hitting the right spot. Uh, never go above 75% resources if you can help it. A spike is okay. Don't run your service at sustained 99% because bad things happen. Uh, keep track of things like some asterisk internals, uh, which are more like uh, more or less uh, strictly pertaining to call setups. So call setups are uh, when you start a new call. It's important, and it's one of the biggest things that we did with getting performance in place, that instead we have 20 calls. Don't dial 20 calls at the same instant. Stagger them by, I don't know, 20, 30 milliseconds is enough to dramatically improve throughput, because you're not overloading the asterisk internals. Just stagger them slightly. You don't need to do a call per second, of course, because otherwise it sort of defeats the purpose of a dollar. Stagger them by just a few milliseconds, and it's given us great results. And if you can space them apart just a little more, just do that. It's the best thing you can do. Then it's the duration stuff, which is pertaining to duration. Again, this talk is not about duration, so I'm going to go over that briefly. Duration allows you to do anything, so good but also evil. So things like you, you shouldn't connect to databases with addition. Uh, you should have uh, you should do HTTP or uh, message queues instead. That kind of stuff. So in general, there's a few things you need to avoid, but those pertaining to the application domain, and you can do without. You can build this application without addition. We did that just because it's what we do. Uh, 
Okay, so what do we end up doing to monitor and getting the numbers that we needed to be sure that everything was in place? My new favorite tool, bar none, is Homer and Safe Capture. I'm sad to see new, but I hadn't really used Homer. My engineers used that for a while. Uh, this was my personal project, like learn to use Homer and use it to analyze and uh, evaluate quality of this large project. It's extremely valuable. If you have to spend an hour learning something, go install Homer and learn how it works. It will tell you literally everything about what's going on in your network, including the most important thing in this particular case, which is quality of service. Quality of service is uh, what your users perceive as being uh, a good call. So they they hear audio clearly. Uh, the, time, the response time are appropriate. So you press the TMF and it doesn't take three seconds before something actually happens. All of those are uh, a function of what you discussed earlier and can be monitored using Homer. How does Homer work? It will install a small module that's called an HEP capture agent in each of your asset servers, and that will effectively be a uh, mirror of the network traffic that your asterisk is generating, and that mirror will be sent to Homer for analysis. That means that you're not touching your real network traffic. That's completely untouched. You just copy it over. That means there's zero impact on the server itself when it comes to monitoring. While if you were doing this uh, some other way, like doing, I don't know, to speed dump online, something like that, you effectively will have something looking at your packets, which is something that will deteriorate performance somehow. Of course, there's other stuff, like CP. Who has used CP before here? Who has liked using CP? Okay, so okay, we all know we all know what's about the CP. It's a great tool. It's uh, the most uh, the, bad, the worst user experience ever, but it's great. So if you need to use CP, use CPCup. It's a Ruby library that will at least take some of the pain out of it by generating the XML for you via a sort of readable uh, DSL. You still have to know how CP works, which is not that easy, but at least the pain of getting the XML correct without having the errors in the XML that usually kills you when you're starting out with CP will be gone because the library will write it correctly for you. Um, SNGrab and SIPGrab are great tools for to do quick CLI visualization. What is going on? Why did that call not connect? Or what happened in that call? All of those will give you both visualization and analysis. And when all else fails, and we had to resort that to that a couple times, and everybody has to from time to time, we just went with good old TCP dump. Like, you just get traffic and see what's going on. It's, mm, these days, I'll be honest, I, if Homer is not telling me what's going on, I just drop down to TCP dump and go read the dump myself. It's, uh, it's easier than <laughs> intermediate uh, ideas. So, results. What did we get out of all these things? We built a system. We tested the system. We, make, we built a way to deploy the systems, to scale them, to test them. So, our test nodes run a sustained load of four, about, so 400 is the threshold we set. Uh, they can, uh, of course, run more calls, and as we said, we allow them to be above 400 for a short period of time to avoid auto scaling be too aggressive. So, it's not like a server hits 401 and we spin up a new server, which is it's 450, uh, and it's over a, at least half an hour. Uh, CPS is kept as just 25. 25 sounds like it's a low number for calls per second. People that are be working on other types of data will tell me that this is not much. But keep in mind, this is a small. It's a, this is a set of very small Astra servers running just a few calls. So I just add more if I need more CPS. More important thing with having many nodes is that if you lose one, you only lose the calls that are on those no on that node. Since we don't really care about you know call keep alive, recovering calls. Uh, if you lose a node here, at worst we're losing 400 active calls. It's never happened by the way; they don't die. But if it happens, you just lose a little. Um, we could go higher, and uh, we will probably just because we can save 10 or 15 percent in money by running a little bit less servers in, um, in numbers. Uh, Ten minutes? Oh, I, I, so I said I thought it was five. Great, <laughs> I started the timer wrong. Uh, yeah, each asterisk servers. So the web the web application doesn't need much. 
as you know, when you got a good database set up, a good web, uh, web server set up, and a good Redis set up, you don't need many nodes there. Those three servers are going to be there for the conceivable future. Right? We, we don't anticipate spinning up more than one or two more web application servers in the next year or so. Well, here we're running 30 to 40 active uh, Astrid servers at a time. If you make the calculations, it sounds like a lot of money. Like, are you, how many machines are? So first of all, these are not many machines for many, many deployments. But secondarily, these are $40 per month boxes. So this is just really $1,600 per month right now. It's nothing in the grand scheme of uh, operating a system on this scale. And if we, we double that, it's still not much money. So essentially, uh, the goal was to operate a system that could be scaled up as much as needed because the customer that made uh, that hired us to build the system will eventually be expanding to other states and other uh, business uh, types, and they will just need to hold the capacity they can handle when doing this admittedly low importance calls. They're not important, low quality, they're short duration, but they're still, I mean, they're so useful. So what did we learn building this application and others? Um, there's, I, I made a top 10, like they're not, in, they're really not in any particular order, or they're not just 10 tips, but I had to give structure to it, so here it is. So, stagger call setup. This is very important. Don't run, if, even if you have just 20 calls, don't dial 20 calls. Dial one, just loop it over. And with a few milliseconds delay, that greatly improved uh, our performance. And it's something I actually need to talk about with the <laughs> Astros developers at some point, just to figure out why that's, that, uh, that result would be so important. It's like a tenfold increase in performance. Yeah, of course, but I mean, I, I, I would really like to know that because uh, it's a, a something we observed and not something we know where it comes from. So don't dial your calls exactly at the same time, just a few milliseconds after. Uh, having calls, this is important because this might inform your decisions about infrastructure. The number of calls is the most important thing you care about, especially when you're doing short duration calls. All I, I need the most uh, cores I can do, as opposed to the second most important thing is having ma much memory, so more memory. And the least important thing, almost non-relevant in the context of modern systems. So granted, if you're saying I have 128 Pentium 200 MMXs, then no. But uh, comparing them to absolutely normal core speeds on the various uh, VM providers you can have, uh, you don't really care about CPU speed. Number of cores you can throw at the problem is the key to getting good performance out of uh, They don't, know, they don't all have to be on the same machine. That, that's what I was getting to. The total course you're running in your domain. Of course, but it's also running less calls per machine. Okay. So it's, it's what, we, what we saw when we decided large servers versus small servers is that there's not much difference. If you have 128 uh, cores on the same machine, or you split them up and eight machines. In this domain, it doesn't really matter much, which is another thing and we need to investigate more just to be sure that we're down the right path. But the more important thing is how many cores you have available in total. You can even run 128 one core machine, though that's a little slow. Granted, again, everything has to be taken into the context of being uh, reasonable. So not 128 one core machines may be in run 64 two cores or something like that. Uh, most of your time is spent in networking, so the application layer, layer doesn't really mean much. We used addition, and I was worried addition will be a performance drag in this particular case. It doesn't care at all, because of most, uh, most of what is happening in this particular case is SIP dialogues, for the most part. So really, uh, don't bother too much with optimizing your application layer when you're just running a lot of calls, because it will matter very late in the development process. Servers are cattle, not pets. Please, please, please stop SSHing into servers. Don't. I am one step from removing SSH access from all of our servers. Like, you cannot interact with them, I'm sorry. That if, if one of them goes down, we just kill it and build another. That's how important it is. Uh, having a repeatable, consistent deployment uh, uh, method is the single most important thing in nowadays IT. 
Of course, turn off CDR, another expensive operation. This goes hand in hand with the um, d disabled modules in asterisk. Uh, you want to uh, have as little things that you don't care about going on as, uh, as possible. Since we don't actually use CDR, but instead we report through the Redis queue, we turn off CDR, we turn off anything that could not be, that's not really used by the application. Uh, that's also important, and keep in mind that most of your Astro servers have lo are loading modules and performing operations you don't need. I'm, I, can, uh, I, can, I can be certain of that. So keep the database away from addition. This has been a big performance hit for us. Uh, keep the database away from addition. It's been a, uh, it's been a pain point for us. So uh, this is specific to addition, but it's big enough in performance that I want to stress that out. So don't connect to the database with addition. It's no longer recommended, and using other methods is way better. Look into JRuby. We're running with JRuby with great results. JRuby is uh, a concurrent version of Ruby running on the JVM. And this is currently in testing for us, but it's been improving application performance, which at the point we're at, which is a system that is already in production and working, is giving us you know, those 2 3% extra. Avoid transcoding. Again, this is mm, basic, uh, this is what we hit. So make sure you're not transcoding media anywhere. You don't care, just run G711 and let the network handle it. Learn to use Homer. This was an eye opener for me. This changed my way of working around telephone applications and I'm not even kidding. Like it's, uh, I don't know why I put it off for so long. I should have looked into, into it way earlier. And that's the most important thing. Make your application servers as dumb as possible. The asterisk addition uh, stack I described does not do anything that is not picking up a, Redis, a call from Redis, downloading the audio files, dialing the call, and telling me what went on with that call. It has no notion of how many other servers I have, what's going on, uh, how many calls I'm running. It doesn't care about anything. All of that is handled by the Rails application that will push calls to the queue at the appropriate time. So, uh, I think we're about mm, on time. Uh, well, thank you. I know it's been a whirlwind tour. There's a lot of content there, but feel free to ask questions. And thank you for listening. <laughs> wow, so many questions. So, I know we were asking questions of Luca during his presentation there. We've got about two minutes, I think, for questions. Uh, so, anybody in the audience? Yes. I was wondering if you guys are using a proxy and uh, which version of Asterisk? Asterisk is Asterisk 13, uh, latest 13, and we're not using proxy. It's just Asterisk dialing out. Other questions, right here. So uh, you mentioned that it, 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 uh, the application is dumb. It doesn't know anything else. So when a, a person actually answers a call and presses one link back, how do you find out which agent is available? You can, of course, dial a ring group, but then you lose capability of doing uh, performance-based routing, for instance. So how do you handle that? Because at the start of the call, the agent's not available. When the call is actually answered, the agent is available and you can link back to it. In this particular case, this is a uh, this is mm, this application. This entire application is fronting call centers that these guys are running. So what we do really in this particular case, we just dial the call center number. So it doesn't matter to this particular application for this particular usage, and it's very specific to this. You're right. You of course need to know some kind of state. In which case, I don't know. I maybe use Redis again or something like that. But in this particular case, it doesn't matter because when you press one, you just get patched into one other call center will do whatever it needs to do. I, to, to your point too, I think Luca's point is generally applicable whenever you possibly can keep that application state off of your asterisk boxes or other things so that you can scale each piece differently, right? Because your, your agent pool is going to scale differently than your outbound dialing, which is going to scale differently than the astro, actual asterisk boxes themselves. And the more you decouple these things, the more you enable that horizontal scalability. Hold on real quick. I, what was that? Is it possible to get a copy of this tape? All, all the presentations are going to be online. Um, yeah, later. Okay. Yep. Any other questions for Luca? Oh, Mark. Um, <laughs> yeah, of course. Um, so do you use any other tools other than Homer for uh, monitoring call quality for MOS scores and things like that? Right now, not on the system. Like Homer is providing more than enough. Again, this is a very specific system with very specific requirements of low importance calls. So we just need to make sure that it's generally behaving correctly. It's different than other situations. We've recently done something very similar to what you've done. 
And um, one thing I just wanted to ask you, in the AMI, when the events are coming back, is have you ever seen an event for a bound, uh, a, a bound event coming back from AMI repeat itself for the same re um, request? I don't think I've ever seen a double AMI. No, um, I have never seen that or heard that report. Okay. So you have cool. to get a capture and report it up. Yeah. We can, we can take a look, but yeah, I haven't seen that yet either. Well, well another question back there, and then I think this will be our last question because we're right at 12 o'clock here. Hi. Uh, your platform is using MEI. Have you considered using AREI? Not really, but that's that's not even a technical choice we did. We have a version with Ransom AMI, and uh, this application is so disproportionately about uh, the volume of calls than the actual application logic. The application logic is 100 lines of Ruby, to be honest, All right. uh, that we didn't even consider rewriting it something different. So it's a choice we did not make because we had addition available. Nothing, there's nothing against or for either of them. It's just what we did. Can I, ask? Uh, I see that you are using Redis. I also use Redis in another project. Are you considering or you will be interested to participate in a project to create a, a driver for Redis for Asterisk? Uh, well, we can talk about it. Why not? Okay. And have you considered using VIP Monitor instead of Homer? Uh, I think that's commercial, right? Uh, yeah, but uh, it's pretty cool. Yeah, but I'm, I, I know some of our customers use it. I personally haven't seen it. Uh, one thing I will just uh, add as an addendum, uh, um, Gaston Brock actually has written a predictive outbound dialer using ARI. So if you're interested in that approach, you could go find out how he did that part. So, yep. Yep. Any Thanks other so questions? Everybody. All right. Great. Thank you.